Um, let's get started. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another paper reading group at Wits and Biases. And today we're going to be looking at the end-to-end -end object detection with transformers. So this is a um, shift from what we've been doing at the paper reading group so far. Uh, we've been looking at mostly uh, common architectures like EfficientNet V2. We've looked at transformer architectures like Vision Transformer, um, Kite, Paper, and mostly we've looked at classification kind of architectures and classification uh, related papers. But I thought um, computer vision is a big field and object detection is one part of those is, is, a, is a major part of that computer vision field. So I thought maybe this could be a good shift and that we should also start looking at object detection papers, given that we've already looked at a lot of transformer papers. So it only made sense to see where else transformers have been applied. And uh, one place where they've been applied very efficiently has been in object detection as well, apart from language and apart from just computer, uh, just classification type of problems. So uh, if you could maybe uh, just double checking that everybody can see my screen. Um, and if you could please just post in the chat that you can see uh, 1db.me slash DETR. So if I go to my browser, can you see my browser as well, please? So if I go 1db.me, so this is the same as uh, every paper reading group, but for those that are new, um, to this, for, for those that have it's the first time in this paper reading group. If you go to that link, 1db, I've just posted, I'll just post that in the chat as well. So 1db.me slash DETR. So if you go to that link, it will take you to this paper reading group, DETR. And uh, this is where you'll end up. So just go in there, write a comment. So as we're going through the paper today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, because we also share, we also live on YouTube and it's difficult for me to look at the Zoom chat. It just makes things a bit easier if we post all our comments over here and then I can address those questions and I can keep coming back to them as we go. Uh, something I do want to point out is that, uh, so this, uh, the paper that we're looking at is again, uh, object detection. So that's the paper, end-to-end -end object detection with transformers. Um, and one good thing about this paper is that they have open source code. So um, if we go to that URL, which is this repository here, you'll see that Facebook research has uh, open source the DETR code detection transformer. And this is not a new transformer. This is not something that's just come out recently. Like we've been discussing very cutting edge papers recently that have come out uh, within the past two, two and a half months or when we were looking at the MLP mixer paper, um, but this is more of a paper that's now been stable and has been there for a while, for I guess a year and a half. And uh, one thing I do want to highlight is if you're interested in, sorry, one second. Um, one thing I do want to highlight is this annotated DETR. Um, is this annotated DETR? Can you, well, sorry, one sec. I'm just able to see this uh, background, the PowerPoint in the background. Okay, that's gone now, that's better. Um, so if you go to that blog post link, I will share this in the chat, or it would have been shared with you guys as part of the reminder anyway. Um, but I've just put that in the chat. Um, so anything that we're going to learn today, if you want to see how that's been implemented in that particular repository uh, from code, uh, then this is called the annotated DETR. And the simple idea is we go paragraph by paragraph in the paper. And then we look at the code that's corresponding to that particular paragraph. So if I go, for example, uh, let's see, which one should I look at? Let's see if I go to the transformer. Um, and you will see how this is mostly stuff from the DETR transformer. So you'll see how this is the figure that's related to that transformer. And underneath this, this code and how the transformer has been implemented. So anything that's been, for example, the transformer decoder, um, anything that's been directly copied from the paper is in italics in this paper, uh, in this blog post, and then you'll see how the transformer decoder has been implemented in PyTorch. So if you want to have a look at the code, we won't be uh, looking much into the code today. Um, we'll mostly be spending time just reading the paper, um, but I just want to highlight this as a resource for anybody that's interested in, in um, looking at things on how they're implemented in PyTorch. So that's that. That's just the introduction about the ETR, um, but let's, Let's see now, uh, let's get started with, with the paper. Sorry, give me one second. All right, um, so we're gonna look at this end-to-end -end detection paper today. Uh, so let me bring up my OneNote, uh, my best friend, which is this software.
So as you will see in this uh, part of, uh, in the end-to-end -end object detection with transformers, as you will see, um, I'm, I'm also, I haven't been doing object detection for many, many years, but I have been doing this for quite some time now, a few months. And one thing I've realized is when I was capping, catching up with the literature, I saw how object detection has also advanced here quite a bit. So we started with one stage and two stage detectors in the past. So we used to have things like RCNN or we used to have things like YOLO, which are still very relevant in today's world. Um, so for general object detection, you'll see libraries like and this is just me providing context. So you'll see libraries like Detectron True, uh, Detectron 2, which is again by Facebook Research, uh, which is a very popular library that uh, has pretty much a lot of the models that you'll see from, from a bit older, like RetinaNet or all those models. And then there's another one, which is MM Detection. So I think these are both really good repositories to get started with object detection. But with Transformers, uh, there's all of these separate repositories that are there um, in this world, well, in this day and age right now, but I think that might change in the future. Um, but anyway, so then what's the difference in object detection with transformers and all of these past uh, methods that I just showed you that are part of those repositories? Uh, one of the main methods is that first, um, this uses transformers. So that's the main one, I guess. Um, in DETR, you're using transformers. But another one is that this uh, paper looks at object detection as a direct set prediction problem. So what does that mean? So until now, um, I'll give you some context again. Until now, what used to happen is you used to have things like anchor boxes, or we used to have object detection used to depend on some prior knowledge. So you used to have like, uh, we used to have region proposal networks. So what would happen uh, before this paper came around or typically uh, is that you have an image. Sorry, that's a bit too. Uh, that should be better. Um, so you have an image and let's say um, here's an object in the image. Here's an object in the image. And what used to happen or would, would happen before this is that you would pass this through a region proposal network, I'm just gonna call it RPN. And what that RPN does is it finds regions of interest in this image. So that could be a region of interest, that could be a region of interest. And then based on that, you start doing classification. So you say, okay, this belongs to class one and this belongs to class two. So then you're able to do object detection and classification. But you can see how these region proposal networks have been quite a bottleneck for quite some time because you'll, um, Mostly they're used as a black box. And also you don't have an end-to-end -end pipeline. What I mean by that is you're dependent on something that's not part of the object detection system in itself. Like this is not something you can change or this is not something you can train. And so you don't have a very end-to-end -end pipeline. And what that does is it makes things hard to customize. So then this paper, uh, what they say is we look at it as a direct set prediction problem. What does that mean? It means that we get rid of any extra stuff that's uh, any any extra or third party or you know anything that's that's not part of this paper is not used in the DETR architecture. So they pretty much say that uh, DETR architecture is like this standalone architecture that can be used to object that can be used to do object detection in an end-to-end -end manner. So from having you just have to provide the input images and the bounding boxes. And then based on that, this network on its own is able to do object uh, detection, is able to learn everything that you want to do. And in fact, uh, when you go through the repository, you'll see not only is it able to do object detection, it's also able to do segmentation. Um, but for this part of the paper reading group, I'm mostly going to focus on the object detection part. The um, segmentation is only a small change in just the network head. Um, but having said that, uh, let's just have a look at the abstract. So I think one of the main uh, parts of the paper are just is just the abstract itself. So we should actually, I actually spend a lot of time uh, reading the abstract very carefully. So as I said, um, our approach streamlines the detection pipeline and it takes away the need for many hand design components. So you used to have things like non-maximum uh, su suppression, which is NMS or anchor generation. So what NMS used to do is like, it's just like a post-processing as I understand, is that when you have duplicate bounding boxes, it would just take away the duplicates. So you used to have anchors 
So what happens in anchors is like if you have an image, you pretty much divide it into uh, a grid, and then these become your anchor boxes, and you see, okay, is there a, is there like a an object inside, or like that just becomes as a reference. Um, so what this paper is saying is that we don't need anchor boxes, we don't need NMS. So we, we don't really need any prior knowledge about the task. That's the way how this uh, detection transformer uh, has been designed. And then it says, given a fixed small set of learned, uh, learned object queries, DETR, reasons about the relations of the objects and the global image context to directly output the final set of predictions in parallel. So the word global, I think is, is important because when we were using uh, region proposal networks, then as you can see, you only have a look at the, uh, you only have a look at the regions that have been highlighted or that have been sort of flagged by the region proposal network. But in this case, you have a look at the whole image when doing object detection uh, in the DETR architecture. So then, and the main thing is DETR demonstrates accuracy and runtime performance on par with well-established and highly optimized faster RCNN baseline on the COCO object detection data set. So not only is this a, in a way a simpler end-to-end -end way of doing things, but it is also able to get the same accuracy and it is also able to get the same runtime performance as the current or as the state of art art networks or as the uh, you know as as a very competitive baseline which has been faster rcnn and then as i've already mentioned uh, the code is present here and then it's it significantly outperforms competitive baseline so that's the overall introduction about about the etr um, so then there's there's two or three main things about this architecture, um, but let's just go through the introduction. So this is the, I think I've done a shift from the past paper reading groups. And in this one is that we're actually gonna go section by section, but uh, we're gonna go in a different, a slightly different order than, than we generally do. But I just wanna point out this thing. So modern detectors um, or previously, until before DETR, you used to have things like, you used to have a large set of proposals, which have already mentioned is the region proposal network, or used to have anchors, or you used to have window centers. So that is how things used to be. And these were surrogate regression, pretty much, because you used to have like a reference point. And then from that reference point, you would see, okay, this is my bounding box prediction. How good or bad is it? It's not like, uh, not like classification where you have some predictions from the model, and then you directly match it to the actual ground truth. So that's, that's not how things used to be. But that's changing, well, in 2021, that's changing quite rapidly. Um, and a big part of that is thanks to the DEDR paper. Okay, um, so then to simplify these pipelines, which is again, these surrogate regression pipelines, we assign a direct set prediction approach. Uh, and then this is an end-to-end -end philosophy. It has led to significant advance we've seen like this sort of transformer or this sort of end-to-end -end philosophy, which has led to uh, advances in other fields, but as they mentioned in this paper that at the time of writing, not so much in object detection. So previous attempts, they have these either surrogate tasks or there's like two stage, um, but this paper, what it does is that it aims to bridge this gap. So as you can see in this uh, figure one, you will see that this is uh, just a general uh, overall uh, just a general overall idea of how the DETR uh, architecture looks like. Sorry, one second. Okay, um, so as you can see then in this, you will see uh, just how the overall architectures looks like. So you have some input image, um, and this is how I mean that this is how it's different, is that your input image directly goes to a CNN. So you get some set of image features. What does that mean? You know, we, we can use CNN as backbones. So what does that mean is that you could have an efficient backbone, but instead of doing classification, instead of you could keep the whole architecture until the point you have the global average pooling. So this CNN would then output some features, right? So if your input is, let's say, uh, if the, my batch size is one and number of channels is three, and then I have two to four by two to four, which is my height and width, two to four by two to four. Um, and then I could pass this image to the CNN and I could get some output of the image features, which could be say uh, 256. So these 
obviously when you go through a CNN, your number of channels goes up and your image dimension goes down. And I'm just making these numbers up. So don't, we'll, we'll look at the exact number of channels and we look at the exact numbers just in a while. But I just want to give you a sense of like, okay, how does, how do things really work? So what happens is the number of channels will go up. And uh, as we know, a CNN, it will just reduce the spatial dimension. So you go like something like 48 by 48. So instead of having two to four by two to four, you've reduced the height and width, but you've also increased the number of channels. And so that's the idea. So once you have that, this now smaller matrix becomes a representation of the image. And then you pass that through a transformer encoder decoder architecture. We will look at exactly uh, what that architecture is. But then this is how uh, the DETR is very different from the, the previous uh, papers that I read about object detection, is that you get a set of bounding box or pretty much predictions. And you see how these different colors they're like different predictions that you get from the architecture, but you can match that using this idea of bi bipartite uh, matching loss. So you use this bipartite matching loss and you match the predictions with the ground truths directly. So at this point, you don't need any anchor boxes. You don't need anything. Um, and this is how the DEDR architecture, when we look at it, it looks very simple. And it is actually very simple because if you, when you read through this paper, they'll say, oh, we've tried to make the training pipeline really easy. And um, the DEDR architecture on its own doesn't need any uh, special sort of, uh, any, any special sort of modules. You just need pretty much, sorry, one second, um, any library that, that can do uh, convolution and you have the transformer architecture as part of the library, which is pretty much PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, or pretty much any library that you uh, use for deep learning. They have the convolution and transformer architecture as part of them. So they say in, in this paper, there was some line mentioned somewhere that said, oh, because of this, because the architecture is so simple, uh, in a, that you can actually use any library that you like to implement the DET architecture. It does not require any special libraries that have to implement these black box networks like RPN or you, need, you don't need to worry about anchor generation or all that sort of stuff, which is quite clunky and which has been a block bottleneck. So that's the idea behind DETR. So as we see, uh, there's, there's good stuff written here. We adopt an encoder, encoder decoder architecture. So what does this encoder decoder architecture mean? Well, uh, that's from attention is all you need uh, transformer. So as has happened with many fields, like when the transformer architecture came about in attention is all you need, you um, not only was that a big, big success in natural language processing and let me see where the architecture is. Uh, encoder decoder stacks there it is um, so that's the architecture which is the attention is all you need paper which introduced multi-head attention um, and we we sort of start, started the first time this was applied was for machine uh, translation so sorry language translations from say english to german or that sort of uh, that sort of objective but then people realized that this architecture is actually very helpful for all of these other task as well, or in computer vision, then the encoder was taken and the vision transformer was born. So this is me just again, giving context and we're not really looking at uh, the DETR, but I'm just giving context on how things have evolved. So you saw that there's like this images word 16 cross 16 words, which is transformers, which pretty much applies the same architecture, but just I think, believe the encoder um, for, for classification. So I can see where is the transformer do we have? Do we have an image? There it is. So you see how it's just using the transformer encoder, but that's again for classification. Then for object detection, I'll go up. Um, then for object detection, you have end-to-end, -end, which is the DETR architecture. So that's the idea. That's the encoder decoder architecture. Again, uh, I'm just having a look if there's any important bits that I should cover here. Um, so this is the main bit, like as you can see in figure one, which is the figure I just showed you, it's this figure at the top. Uh, you can see how you predict all objects at once and it's trained end to end with set loss function. So we will look at the loss function. We will look at what this bipartite uh, matching means and we will look at all of these in, in a lot more detail in just the coming uh, few moments. But right now I just wanna sort of 
uh, introduce you to this idea of how DETR is different. So this is just me kind of providing you an overall sort of uh, objective or that's sort of overall uh, idea of how the ETR architecture looks like. So you can see we don't need spatial anchors, we don't need NMS, that's just been a repeat. And that's it. Oh, this is the bit where I said the ETR doesn't require any customized layers and thus can be reproduced easily in any framework that contains standard CNN and transformer classes, which means you can implement this in TensorFlow, you can implement this in PyTorch really, really easily. And that's why the DETR could be its own separate repo. And when we'll have a look at, or when you have a look, go through the annotated DETR, you'll see that things are um, really simple and straightforward to implement this architecture. Okay, um, so that's the basics of it. Uh, this is where they say, you know how um, until now in the paper reading groups, I've been mentioning ImageNet a lot. Uh, similarly, in object detection, you have this Coco data set, which is kind of this baseline. Um, and then that's just used for detection instead of, um, instead of classification. So I believe it just struck me that I haven't really said what object detection is. I just assume that everybody who's on this call knows what object detection is. So object detection just means if you have an object in classification, you say this is a horse, this is a cat or you know whatever the object category is. In object detection, you not only classify, but you also provide the coordinates. So you say, okay, this goes from X1, Y1, or you know, just pretty much you just provide the coordinates in the image. So that that this uh, problem is then object detection. Sorry, that's something I should have done right at the beginning, but anyway, let's keep going. If you're here as part of the DETR, I'm sure you'd been you'd know what object detection is. Um, so then uh, one thing I would like to uh, point out here is that DETR demonstrates significantly better performance on large objects. But one thing that's been pointed out in this paper is that it, however, obtains lower performance on small objects. But uh, since this paper was in 2020, uh, so let's see, I, I believe it was around September 2020. What exactly? Uh, 28 May 2020, sorry. So it was in May 2020. And um, since that time, a lot of uh, a lot of new architectures have come up like the deformable DETR, up DETR, or like there's these other architectures that have come up based on the DETR architecture. And then they have tried to look at this uh, downside of like the lower performance on small objects. Um, so that's that. And that's pretty much it in terms of introduction to DETR. Um, I won't look into the related work because we'll come back to that later. I think I won't look at the loss function right now as well. So I'm gonna skip this, this part of section three of actually having a look at the loss function, but we're gonna do things a bit differently is that we're gonna have a look at the architecture first. So we're gonna have a look at how, when we pass an image to this DETR architecture, how does it process that image? And then how does it really pass, uh, how does it really give out the, uh, classification outputs and the object detection outputs. And then we're gonna see, and then we're gonna go back at the loss function. And then that's when we're gonna see how, uh, how those outputs can, how those outputs can be used to calculate the loss. So let me put that in one note, one second. Oh, I am in one note, one second, sorry. So if I go and I add a section here. So as I said, the way we're gonna look at is the first thing was the intro. Then we're gonna look at the overall architecture. So that's second. And then finally, we're gonna look at the loss. So in this overall architecture, we're gonna see how things look like. So if this is my architecture, let's say this, cube is my DETR architecture. We're gonna understand how things look like if I pass in an input image, then how does it really give me the bounding box and my class probabilities? Prob, I'm just gonna call it prob. Okay, so, so we're gonna have a look at this part of this whole architecture. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna have a look at the locks function. So you're gonna see, okay, now we have our outputs. How do these outputs compare to my ground truth and then we can see how to calculate the loss um that's how um today is going to look like but let's see if there's any questions on that report so let me go back to that report 
Yes, uh, that is correct. Does surrogate pipeline mean using RPN for anchoring? Oh, well, pretty much surrogate tasks means just you have a separate task. You don't actually just compare the output with the ground truth. You have some other third task that does it. Um, in bipartite matching, how ground truth boxes can be compared while actually trying to identify the same object. Okay, these are questions we haven't really looked at any of this. So these are questions we'll come back to later. But let's first go and have a look at the overall architecture. Um, so let's see that. So in figure two, this is where the overall architecture has been defined. And I'm gonna look at this architecture a slightly bit differently. We're gonna have a look at this figure too, and then I'm also gonna show you how the transformer inside looks like, okay? And then if there's interest, I can also show a overall idea of how um, these things can be implemented in code, but we, we'll get to that in a while. So let's see, sorry, I've lost the architecture. Um, so there we are, that's the architecture. Um, so let me actually just copy paste that in a new part. So there's, it's less clunky. So let's paste this here and then, okay. So what happens is, this is what happens. I have my, let's say I have my input image. So I'm just saying three channel, uh, two to four. This is two to four, two to four. Two to four by two to four is just a number that I've come up with. Uh, it could be four, 448. Usually in object detection, you have uh, higher size images like 640 by 640, but I'm just, um, don't code, like don't take these numbers, take them with a grain of salt. And then these are just numbers I wanna present just so everybody has a good understanding of what's going on in the overall, overall architecture first. And then you have three channels. So the three channels are red, green, and blue, okay? So this is my input, which is my input image. You pass that to the CNN. Now this CNN could be a ResNet 50, it could be a ResNet 101, it could be any CNN, uh, like an efficient net, or could be any backbone that can extract some information from my input image. So any backbone that we've looked at in the past could be used to extract information or could be used to extract image features. So what this would do is that once I have my CNN, what could happen is that my outputs, again, what's gonna happen is that instead of having three channels, I'm going to have say something like, I said 256 in the last time, but let's say I have 2048 or actually let's just keep with 256. So let's say I now have 256 channels and then my feature size gets reduced to 40 by 40. So that's the image features here, right? These image features are 256 by 40 by 40. Um, and then that's my, uh, that's, that's just the output. That's like a representation of my image. And then I have my positional encoding. So what happens is uh, if you see my input, I'm just showing you and I just want to, uh, sort of highlight an example is like if this is 40 by 40 so I'm just uh, making a grid of like 40 by 40 then each position the transformer uh, from the attention is all you need paper you'd know that the transformer doesn't quite know the order or like it doesn't really know what position things are in so if we pass the transformer ex expects the input to be in a sort of a sequence so let's say um, when we were doing translation, if I said, I am Aman, right? Uh, the transformer doesn't know that this is position three or this is position one, this is position two. The transformer has no idea about the ordering of things. And that's why, again, this idea of positional encodings is coming from that attention is all you need paper. So what you do is you pass in positional encodings I will explain exactly what the shape of these positional encodings look like. I will explain all of that stuff in detail in just a little while. But uh, the main idea is then from these features, you need to know how like the how the ordering of things look like. So you pass in these positional encodings over here, which would be the same length as my input. So right now my input is in, in like a form of a tensor matrix. I could just pretty much flatten it out. So my input becomes like, a flattened image. So this is what we do. We've we've have a, had a look at this uh, in a, in a briefly in in the vision transformer, but just from the idea. Now my input is again say a sequence. And then what you do is that to that input uh, to that input image or that input feature, which is this flattened image. What you do is you add these positional encodings. So now when we add 
position encodings, we have to basically inject some positional information to the transformer. So the transformer knows where features are. So the transformers knows, okay, this is the top left and this is top right, or this is, oh, sorry, bottom right, or this is top right and this is bottom left. Like the transformer needs to have some information about the positions and these positional encodings are responsible for doing that. Okay, so that's just the basic idea of why we add positional encodings. And then one thing you'll see when we pass things through the transformer encoder, it kind of it kind of have a looks at the image. It kind of have it kind it has a, it it looks at these position encodings and then it gives some output. So without looking at what goes on in this transformer architecture, there's another beautiful beautiful image that will show you what exactly goes on. Um, let's just take this as a black box. Let's say okay, all of this is a black box, then I can get my prediction outputs, which is pretty much, I get like an output vector. That output vector can go into these feed forward networks, which can say, okay, which can perform the classification, which can perform the bounding box. So let me show you the transformer, uh, what exactly goes on in the transformer. So this is the image, okay. Okay, thanks for doing that to me. Um, so then that's that. Okay. So what happens is, as I've already said, once you have your input image, that input image gets reduced to a smaller feature map. Okay, so this input image will get reduced to a smaller feature map, but it will have a lot more channels. So it will look something like that. So let's say, um, as I've already posted in this uh, blog post, let's say that looks like 256 by 24 by 29. So let's say my number of channels are 256 and then my height and width become 24 by 29, right? Let's say that's what happens. And then what I could do is I could flatten it out. Like this is my 2D grid. This could be one vector, right? I could, because this is just one uh, 2D matrix. I could flatten it out, right? So then I could get my, outputs in this shape. So, okay, all the shapes are now here. So I could get my outputs. Uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt or uh, post the question in, this is the most important part of understanding the DETR architecture and possibly also the most complicated, but bear with me, stay with me. And let's just spend extra 10, 15 minutes just looking at what exactly goes on in the transformer and how the DETR architecture is then able to make those predictions, right? So I'm just trying to marry this uh, this bigger image at the top uh, without looking at this, this is all the transformer. So I'm not gonna look at the transformer from here. This transformer is just this image at the bottom, okay? So right now, all I have is, I had my input image here. I passed that through a backbone, which then gave me 696 by one by 256, okay? Let's say those are my image features. Where does that 696 by one by 256 come from? My, uh, when I pass that through the backbone, remember I said we get 256 by 29 by 24, right? Let's say this is what the backbone is gonna do. What I could do is I could flatten this out. So this, uh, this becomes 256 by 696 and I could reshape. So that's become, that becomes my input to the transformer. Is there any question about, uh, I'll just actually have a look here. In 256 by, can we say 40 cross 40 is the size of the image reduced from 224 by 224? And what is the intuition for 256 channels? Well, 256, Okay, so in a in a backbone or pretty much in convolutional neural networks, what happens is you have a bigger image, like you have a massive image as input. And as this image goes through each of these stages of the convolutional neural network, what happens is the number of channels keeps on going up and the image uh, size keeps on going down. So in a way you don't lose any computation, you don't lose any information. Okay, so then this 40 cross 40 is this smaller, 40 cross 40 is the smaller uh, representation of the bigger image, which is correct. And then the number of 256 channels, in actuality, it is 2048, but then that gets reduced to 256. But let's just say right now, 
256 by 40 by 40 or 256 by 29 by 24. 24. I'm just using 256 by 29 by 24 because that's what uh, the shape is assumed in this image. So I'm just going to assume that when I have some input, which is say three channel 224 by 224, the when I pass that through the backbone, the output becomes 256 by 29 by 24. So this is a lower uh, resolution feature map or like a smaller feature map. So instead of my image being massive, it is now smaller, but it has a lot more channels. Okay. That's just, that's just passing through a backbone. Like that shouldn't be, that's not something that should be confusing at all because um, that's just part of any standard classification. So that's the idea. So that becomes my input to the transformer, okay? See here, uh, let's go at the bigger image. So you can see how things get passed to the CNN. And before things are passed to the transformer from there, I flatten it out. So then my input to the transformer is this. So it can be thought as, I now have a sequence of length 696, where each token is 256 vector long, okay? That's the idea. Like now, after this point, it's just, after this point, it's just, uh, it's like machine translation or it's like language translation because I have my input image converted into a sequence, okay? That's just how we can look at these things. So then what happens is, this is my transformer encoder. Like uh, this is just, again, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the transformer encoder. It's just multi-head attention followed by a feed forward neural network. Again, this is exactly the same as the attention is all you need paper. So where is the attention is all you need paper. So you can see how that is exactly the same as the attention is all you need paper. The one thing we do is we're adding these positional encodings. So as I already said, um, positional encodings are then the transformer needs to know where the relative position or the position of these objects or these different classes or these different labels are in the image. So you have these positional encodings and they're gonna be the same size as my input, right? Why? Um, if this is my input, then I need to have a 40 by 40 grid or pretty much I need to have like, that's exactly how many points or that's exactly how many positions I need to cover for. So I can have my, input uh, as, as like 696, and then each position encoding could be, um, again, this is, if this is confusing about position encoding, again, this idea is straight from the attention is all you need paper. So the position encoding is, instead of it being one number, it's a vector, right? And because right now we have converted our input image into a sequence of length 696, then this is how it looks like. So let's say this is one, two, three, so on, 696. I should make this a bit smaller. So my input is now 696. Then for each of these positions, right? One, two, three, so on until 696, I need to have a positional encoding. So that is why my positional encoding is say 696 by one by 256, because each position is then represented by a 256 length long vector, okay? So that's the idea. So you input both of them, you input that to my transformer, you get some output from the transformer encoder, which is gonna be the same shape. Again, this is just using the transformer architecture as is. You get some output from the transformer, which we call it memory, okay? Then on the decoder side of things, what happens is now we haven't really uh, done any object detection so far, right? We just passed in my input image as a feature. We passed in my spatial position encodings, which is just uh, useful for the transformer to know the relative position or the position of all of these 696 sequence. Um, but we haven't really provided any object queries. So what the uh, authors really did, which is really, really smart of them to do is what you can do, oh, sorry, one second. Uh, what you can do is I can have, uh, in PyTorch, you can have something as nn.embedding. Well, that's just, that's just an embedding. So what that means is I can start with random 100 positions. So they, the authors of DETR, they said, okay, I'm going to assume that there's at max 100 objects in my input image, 
Okay, so my input image right now is this 696 long, uh, vec this 696 long sequence where each part is like a 256 long vector. Okay, so what they said is I'm going to assume that in my input image, there's going to be at max 100 objects, right? So what I can do is I can input 100 cross 1 by 256. So I can input that as my position in embedding. So let's say this is my object positional embedding. Okay. Um, so the idea is then I'm going to input these hundred random positions in my my in my in basically in my transformer decoder. So this is what happens when I pass in my object queries over here. These are just Right now, the network hasn't learned anything. These are just random 100 positions in my input image. And then what I say is, OK, uh, in, my, in my input, when I, when I answer these random, when I basically input these random object queries, firstly, these object queries will start to perform self-attention within themselves. So this is what's happening. This is why this is called self-attention, because now the objects are like these 100 as the network will learn more and more, it needs to know like, okay, where the objects are or what the relation is between them, right? It needs to know, okay, the cat is there, the fence is there, or like in an image, it needs to know all of these different things. But this, there's mostly a relation between the objects themselves as well, right? So what it's gonna do is right now, because we have these hundred, we just provided the model with random hundred uh, starting points. What the model is gonna do is, as it's going to learn, it's going to learn this relationship between these random hundred. Uh, again, when I say hundred, that's what the number the uh, BETR paper authors have chosen. It could be a different number as well, but this is what they thought. They said, okay, at max in Coco, there's going to be a hundred objects in one image. So then you have this hundred objects sort of interacting between themselves, but we haven't really looked at the image so far, right? That happens here. So once you have this self-attention, which means these 100 objects, these random 100 starting points interacting between themselves, you get some output, which is this output over here. You mix that output with the output from the encoder. So remember, now I have my interactions between the objects themselves. I mix that with the output from the encoder. What the encoder has done, it already took my input image. It already took the positional encodings for the input image, and it has been able to basically look at that input image and has the information about the image. So then we can mix the information about these 100 random objects with the information of the image. So now the transformer decoder actually learns to uh, marry the various object positions within the image itself. I hope that makes sense because this is exactly what's going on in the DET architecture. So you do that over and over and over and over again. You start doing this over and over again, few too many times for uh, say a 300 or 350 epochs, by the time, by the end, what you have is you have this DETR architecture that's then able to learn the position of, for each image, it's able to predict these 100 uh, object queries. It started with the random positions in the image itself, but by the time you finish, it's able to tell, okay, uh, the first object is over here, the second object is over here, the third object is over here, and so on, and it can say the hundredth object is over here. So that's why you get this output of uh, 100 by 256, which is just the output. Forget the six, that just uh, means it's aux, uh, It's using aux loss. So what that means is, in deep learning terms, because the decoder is six layers in the DETR, it takes the output from each of these layers. So if you take the output of 100 by 256 from each of the six layers, your total output becomes like six by 100 by 256. I hope that shouldn't be confusing, but this is exactly what's going on in, um, in the DETR architecture. You start with, again, I'll summarize. Uh, I'll summarize using the, going back to the paper, and then I'll take questions if there are any. So. Let's see DETR. So let's use this, this image now to try and summarize, okay? So I start with my input image over here. This is my input image. The input image goes through the backbone. The backbone will reduce the input image to a smaller feature size, which could be any 
you know, depends on how many, how deep your CNN is or depends on all that stuff. But let's say it is a smaller feature map of 256 channels and then some height with 40 by 40 or 29 by 26. It's just the idea is that the backbone is going to reduce my input image into a smaller feature map. And then for each of the position in that feature map, I'm going to supply a position encoding to my transformer because the transformer has no idea about the relative positions of objects in my image or it doesn't even know how that image is formed. So that's why we're providing these position encodings. And then the transformer encoder will do its magic. What does that mean? That just means that it's gonna take my uh, backbone output, it's gonna take my position encoding output, it's going to mix the two. And then because the, now the transformer has information about the position of these various pixels in my image, and it also has the image information itself, it's now able to give some output, which I call, let's say memory. This memory is this output from the transformer encoder, which is the transformer's way of encoding my input image into some matrix inside so that's just a way of like let's just call it an intermediate output it's just a representation of my image so that the transformer knows where each of the different objects are in my image it's basically just the transformer reading my input image and then storing that information it's just like we humans do we we look at an image and then let's say we store that information in our eyes that we know okay uh when we look at an image for example, in front of me, I can see, okay, the laptop is over here, the door is on my right. So that's just like a, a map of what that input image looks like. And then uh, in the transformer decoder side of things, this is where this is where all the interesting fun this is all the interesting stuff happens, all the inter interactions happen. Is that now if I'm trying to do object detection, I start with some random positions of these hundred different objects. So for example, in my room, I could say, okay, I think the decks desk is going to be on my right. It doesn't matter if the desk is on the left, okay? It doesn't matter. I can say, okay, I think the desk is going to be on my right. And then I think the bed is going to be on my left. I think the TV is going to be in my front. I start with some random positions. Then I mix the information that I have. Well, okay, it doesn't make sense that the TV is in front of the bed. I, I hope that th this makes sense that it, it you know, when the TV is in front of the bed, that doesn't look like a good position. So there has to be some interaction between these various different objects. So that happens the first time. And then once you have a, uh, an interaction between the objects, like, you know, okay, uh, where the TV would be related to the bed or where the table would be related to the TV and the bed, then you mix that information with that previous map that I had in my head of the room. So I knew that the door is on the right. I knew that the screen is in front. Um, so instead of now starting with these random positions of these uh, 100 objects, I start to learn the position of these 100 objects. So that's what the decoder is doing. It's mixing the information that we get from the encoder and it's mixing these 100 different uh, it's mixing these hundred different random object locations. So now the decoder, as we go through over and over and over and over again, and we do these multiple, multiple epochs using the loss, uh, it's, it's without telling you what the loss is, um, at this point then the model is actually learning the position of these hundred objects, okay? There might not even be hundred objects in the image. That is fine. We will look at that later, but for, but just have a look at this, that it's just starting with these hundred positions, but it's now able to mix and match and it's able to interact um, based on this information. And then finally, you get some output from the decoder, uh, which I've already said looks like, uh, as you can see, the output looks like this, six by, in terms of shape, six by one by hundred by 256. You could pass that output. Uh, where are we? Uh, you could pass that output to, uh, any feed forward network to get my class and bounding box class and bounding box class and bounding box. That's how the DETR architecture overall works like. Um, okay, I've been talking quite a bit and now is the time to take some questions. So let's go to questions. Oh, sorry, one second.
All right, let's 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 have a look. I could understand positional encoding for 696 as the size of the image, but how positional encoding can happen for 256 channels. What does that mean? Well, um, in positional encoding, I think I would refer you, Durga, to the attention is all you need paper. Uh, it, it's not like the positional encoding is happening for 256 channels. Think of it this way. A positional encoding is a 256 long vector itself. So for each of the 40, okay, uh, let's do it this way. So your input image is like this, right? Your input image is, this is my input image. So let's say this is, uh, oops, sorry. This should be fine. Let's say this is 29. Let's say this is 24, just as an example, right? So this is that, this is that. Now for, and this is 256, okay? This is just my input image right now. Now for each of these positions, this position, this position, this position, this, this, so on, all of these positions, I have my positional encodings as a 256 long vector, okay? That's that. So then I can add my positional encodings to this input image and then I have like a, the transformer has some idea of looking at the position of these uh, various different points in the, in, the, um, in the image. I hope that helps. And if it does help, could you maybe please reply to this comment and just say, okay, thanks, that helped. Uh, how did they get the position encoding? Didn't understand that part. Oh, sorry, which part of position encoding? So in, uh, you, could, you could just start with like with position encodings, there's two ways of having a position encoding. In the attention is all you need paper, you can see how you have sinusoids and cosine, which is just uh, each position gets a representation of a 256 long vector, but you could also learn position encoding. So this, I think uh, this question is coming from more from the attention is all you need paper than from, than from DETR. Uh, but the main idea is, you can have some representation, some 256 vector long representation for each of these different positions in my image. Uh, how are we mixing the transformer output of 696 by one by 256 with 100? Is it doing an attention? Sorry, this is a, I don't get this. How are we mixing the transformer output? Did you mean to say, Ramesh, the backbone output? Uh, yes, the encoder output. Uh, your encoder output is 696 uh, long sequence, right? And then you See. use that in the in the in the decoder um, yeah. object or, or the query vector, which is 100 by 1 by 2 of the 6. And right. When it goes, you mean, this, there, you mean all of this here, right? Yes. This is yes, where yes. the mixing is yes. happening. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, it's just learning to pay attention to the 696. Well, it's just uh, like a 696. You could think of that as a as a sequence. So it's just learning to pay attention to the, these various uh, objects and it's learning to pay attention to the memory. So you can see how my, uh, you can see the query key, uh, uh, query key and value uh, of the inputs of, of this multi-head attention. So I would recommend you without, because uh, if I go into the details- yeah. that take No, it makes sense time. to me, makes sense to me. I had one more follow-up question on the same thing um, is, uh, <clears throat> Does it also, uh, you have M layers in decoder. Does it take the final output of encoder and feed and use that in all M layers of the decoder? That is correct. So it will take the out output from the encoder and then it will go into the first layer of the decoder, which goes one by one by one into the layers. But that's the, that's the idea. Instead of, I think you're thinking it differently. You're thinking of these decoder layers as being separate, but they're actually stacked. So you have your first layer, then you have the second layer on top, then you have the third layer on top, then you have the fourth layer on top. Uh, but you can just pass this output from the encoder to the very first layer, and then you have these other layers stacked. Oh, so it doesn't pass to all, all M layers, only to the first layer of decoder. Uh, yes, that's correct. It passes it to the first layer of the decoder, and then the second decoder layer gets the output from the first layer of the decoder. The third layer of the decoder gets the output from the second layer of the decoder, and that's how this whole system works. Again, uh, this is a question more from attention is all you need than from the DETR paper. But uh, for all of these questions, I would recommend just going back to the, just understanding the transformer architecture quite deeply. Um, but that's the idea. So uh, Durga, I'm still waiting for 
uh, if if that uh, explanation that I helped about this explanation about uh, position encodings does that help or or not, please? Uh, let's see if there's more questions. Is all of the uh, oh excellent thanks uh, or are is all of the learning visual special? I don't even know what that means. Um, or are colors able to in, be incorporated? I don't remember any pixelation talk. As far as I know, what in the TV in front of the bed is neon green. I don't really understand this part. Uh, so I'm really sorry. I don't think I can help answer that question. More about, that was just trying to help create an intuition. Um, in terms of colors, because we have reduced the three channels to 256 channels, you don't have to think of the colors as being three separate channels anymore. The whole image is now 256 channels, 40 by 40. Right, so it's now a lower resolution matrix. Now, what those two fifty six channels are, that's just up to the transformer to learn. So it's a very deep learning way of of doing things. Uh, can you explain why the size is hundred by one by two fifty six and not hundred by one by six ninety six? Oh, okay. Uh, again. I would recommend going through the blog post. Uh, I guess that's where all of these questions will get answered in a lot more detail. But I guess the idea is you're asking why is this 100 by 1 by 256, right? 256 is just a dimension. So 256 is just this dimension that I feel is good enough for my position encoding, right? So when I am adding stuff over here, this uh, I could then just add like these 100 by 1 by 256. These are just my random uh, object locations to start with. So for each of the 100 locations, I'm, I'm calculating like each of the 100 locations are represented by a 256 long vector. But it's, it, has, it hasn't anything to do with the 696. That 696 over here was just the encoder. Like that was just the image being reduced and then the image, that's just the image representation from the transformer encoder, which gets mixed over here. So for the exact shapes and how that marries with 696, again, I would recommend having a look at the blog post. There you will see every single line of code, every single line of uh, the, uh, basically the outputs being explained on what output marries which what shape. And then I think all of these problems or all of these doubts will go away. I'm conscious of time. I'm just going to do, is there a comparison on FPS? I'm pretty sure there is. It says it's very comparable and that's part of the paper. Okay, cool. Let's go back to the, uh, I still have to cover the loss and I think we are running out of time. So I do wanna, in terms of like, I could have, like one thing I do wanna clarify is like, we could have looked at the DETR paper without looking at the shapes. And I could have just like, provided a high level, uh, you know, a high level introduction of like, oh, uh, we start with an input image, then the backbone produces some representation of the image, then that goes to the encoder, and then that output from the encoder gets added to the decoder. And like, I could have done it that way as well. But I think having all these questions about shapes or how they, how they work with each other, in that sense, you understand the architecture in a lot more detail. So it could, like, I, I took the risk of all of this sounding a bit confusing when you start with, but when you have a look at uh, maybe this video again, and when it's up on YouTube, and then uh, you read the log, blog post alongside, I think all of these shapes will make, will make sense. So I, I hope that that does become the case. Um, so again, continuing with, uh, continuing with the loss function. Again, for the loss function, I do wanna, uh, I guess for the loss function, we could look at some of the code as well, uh, but let's see. So where are we? The loss function was section three. Here it is. That's the loss function. Um, so what happens right now, forget about all the shapes and uh, forget about, uh, I guess, Uh, let, let's not worry about all the shapes of what we've learned so far, but let's just now think of this uh, object or, or the or the DETR architecture as this is my 
uh, this is my DETR architecture, and it's giving me an output of 100 possible objects, right? So for each of the 100 objects, it's giving me, say, a bounding box. So that becomes like 100 cross 4. Or for each of the uh, 100 objects, it's also giving me a classification or like a class token. So depending on how many classes we have, I could just have that being classified. OK, so for each of the 100 random positions of the objects that I started with, it's now going to give me when I pass those things through. Uh, so if I go back to my bigger model, where is that image, figure one? So when I go through over here, these set of bounding box predictions are actually going to in include the bounding box coordinates, and they're also going to include the classes, right? Um, and then for each image, I'm also going to have the ground truth. What does that mean? I'm going to know, OK, this is my first label, and then this is the exact bounding box, right? So I need to be able to match those outputs of like 100 outputs from the from the DEDR architecture to the actual ground truth. And when I look at the ground truth, in ground truth, the, the actual uh, number of objects are going to be less than 100. So that's the idea. You, you start with the number of queries, or you basically say, OK, I'm just going to assume there's at max 100 objects in my image. Um, so that's why you have like these, you start with 100 random positions of the objects, or 100 random objects, basically. Uh, but I need to be able to match those outputs with either 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or at max like 10 or 20 objects that are actually in the image. So how do we do that? We use something called, uh, sorry, coming back to section 3. We use something called a set prediction loss. OK. Um, and this set prediction loss is basically called as a, you, you, you're able to, then you need to be able to match my 100 outputs with the ground truth. So I think as part of this, let's just spend some more time. I'm sorry for going a bit over, but let's spend a little bit more time so we also understand or have at least a basic understanding of what goes on in the set prediction loss. So as you can see, one of the main difficulties of training is to score predicted objects with respect to the ground truth. Because right now, uh, you have 100 outputs from the you have 100 outputs from the DETR, but you don't actually know that which output belongs to which ground truth or like uh, I guess let me try and explain that with the help of an image over here. So in my image, let's say I have two objects, right? Let's say this is my object. I'm just going to call it object one, and I'm going to call this object two, right? Uh, and I have 100 predictions for this image. But I don't really know which of these 100 prediction is for object one or which of these 100 predictions is for object two, right? We still need to match because this because these 100 predictions, let's say they, they are like this, right? So this is 100 and this is one. I still need to know, OK, maybe the 25th uh, prediction that the model made is for this first object, and the hundredth prediction that the model made is for the second object. So we need to be able to match the outputs from the DETR architecture to the actual objects. And uh, that is why this task is a little bit difficult. Um, so you, this is one of the main difficulties of training the DETR. And they say what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to use this bipartite matching. So what, what that means is, uh, I'm just looking for the word Hungarian loss that they would mention here. There it is. Uh, so what they're going to say is, I'm going to be able to match my ground truth, which they represent as yi, with my predictions, which they say y sigma I, or basically y hat. I'm going to be able to do a Hungarian algorithm. Now, what exactly the Hungarian algorithm is? It's a way of. Uh, okay, it's a way of. So let's let's look at it this way you have some tasks that you want to do. Let's say you have three tasks you want to do, and you have three workers. So let's say 
my worker one, worker two, worker three, and I have three tasks, T1, T2, T3. So worker one, let's say it takes seven days, worker two takes three days, worker three takes four days, uh, worker one for the task two takes five and so on, just, just like random numbers, and then one, nine, and three. And what you wanna do is, let's say for, uh, for this type of problem, you want to assign each task to a worker such that the total time taken to do the three tasks is minimum and only one worker can do one task. So when you have this type of a problem, that's where the Hungarian matching algorithm comes in very handy. So like uh, we could say, okay, uh, for, for this one to be minimum, task one should go to worker two, task two should go to worker three, and task three should go to worker one. So that the total days taken is one plus two plus three, which is basically six days. So you can accomplish all three tasks by giving it to these different workers, and you can finish it in six days. Now, what, why this, why I wanted to present this and why this is relevant and how this is relevant to Hungarian algorithm, uh, basically, what you do is you calculate a cost metrics. So let me show that in, in actually it's, it's much more nicely expressed in, uh, in code, okay? So you have my outputs. Sorry, I'm just thinking, uh, Never mind. don't worry about this for now. So what, what they do is uh, in paper, what they say is, don't worry about the code for now. I'm really sorry for bringing it up. I I will look at it. I'll show you the code and how all of this uh, relates with the code in just a moment. So what they do is you have these two objects. So object one is here, object two is there. And then for the rest of the 98, they add a class phi or which is just saying, okay, there is no object. And you have like no prediction of the bounding box for this, okay? And then you have these 100, my 100 predictions coming out from the DETR architecture. And what you can do now is you can calculate. So these are my different, these are my various different uh, say classes. So this is class one, this is class two, all of these are five, five and so on. And then let's say this, this says, this is prediction for class one, this is prediction of class three, this is prediction of class seven, or however many classes I have. Um, you could calculate the classification loss. So as you can see over here, it says, I'm calculating my classification loss. So this is just calculating the classification loss, loss between my predictions and the actual classes. This is just like cross entropy, right? So I have, my, I have my classification loss calculated. And then what I can do is, cause my, cause remember my predictions and the ground truth, each of them would have a class label and then would have four coordinates for my bounding box. So these, um, so these, because on the right, these are my class labels. And then I have my four coordinates for my bounding box. Now I could take, for example, these coordinates are say 100, uh, 50, 70, 80. And let's say the prediction here is 120, 10. I'm just making these numbers up, 10, 20, 40. So then I could take uh, the L1 loss, which is, just the diff, uh, which is just a regression loss, which is a very common loss. Uh, I could take that loss between uh, these two things, that, that's what happens over here. And then based on this, I can create my cost matrix, which looks like this. So I have my cost matrix. And then what I can do is I can say, oh, look, there's like these hundred different tasks or there's like these hundred different predictions that are here. And these are my hundred workers. I need to assign these hundred predictions to these say hundred or like these actual objects so that my cost is a minimum. So now, uh, based on this idea, uh, this becomes like, based on this, you can now say, okay, the index one is associated, should be like index, say 29 in my prediction. Then index two should be uh, with index one. So like you can do all this matching. So this goes here, this goes here, this goes there. So basically now you've been able to match the predictions with the actual ground truth. And if you have a look at the code, this is exactly what's going on. Uh, forget the flat, flattened parts, but you can see how I get my output probabilities, I get my output bounding boxes, I get my target IDs, I get my target bounding boxes. What does that mean? I get my output 
So these are my output probabilities, right? These are going to be the class probabilities, and these are going to be the target IDs. And then similarly, I get the four coordinates. So that's what I get over here. And then I can calculate the cost for my classification. I can calculate the cost for my bounding boxes. Uh, the next thing they do say is like we add a generalized box IOU. Forget that for a moment. But then once you have this final cost matrix, which is just this loss, you can use this linear sum assignment or this Hungarian matching, which I, uh, which I showed this idea over here. So you can have this idea now. Now you know, okay, which prediction needs to be assigned to which part of the, the ground truth. And then you once you have that, then that's what becomes lost. Then you start training it over and over and over again. And this is this idea of uh, this is this idea of this set prediction loss. So you can see how you have these, uh, you have the final cost metrics. Uh, and then you can use this linear sum assignment. So what it will do is it will return the indexes. It's going to say, okay, uh, index one should be associated with index 29. And then that's how you finally get. And once you have those indexes, you can now calculate the loss. So you can calculate the loss between uh, my actual prediction and the ground truth. And then I can calculate the loss between this index two, which got assigned to index 100, and then I could calculate the loss between my index 3, which got assigned to, let's say, or, or let's say this index, which got assigned to this part. So now I can now basically uh, look at my predictions, and this is a way how the DETR calculates the loss. Um, so I hope that makes sense. That's this idea of a Hungarian algorithm. Now I'm happy to take as many questions as you guys have. If I have answers from them, for them, I will I will provide those answers. Uh, let's see what the reply to this comment is. Thank you. We'll look at it. Okay. Uh, let's let's see and have a look uh, ourselves. Let's see where the I'm pretty sure it is there. So we are looking at FPS. There we go. Um, Farsa RCNN. That's what the FPS is. DTR. That's what the FPS is. Um, so you want to look at uh, table table one, Nathan. Cool. Uh, if there's no questions then about the DETR architecture. Oh, no, no, they, they are ignored. Um, so one thing you will see, sorry, that's something I should have mentioned. Thanks, Ramesh, for pointing that out. Uh, so one thing you will see, if I go in this loss, you will see, here you go. So you only add the bounding box loss if your thing is not phi. Basically, you only look at the bounding box loss if the object is actually present. So that's a good question. Thanks, Ramesh, for pointing that out. Cool. Uh, then I guess that's where we'll stop at the DETR if there's uh, no more questions. Uh, next week, we have a special guest. And I won't be doing any explanation next week, but we have Ashwarya Kamat, uh, she's joining us. So she is uh, doing her PhD under Jan Lacoon. Um, so you can have a look uh, at, at over here and then you can see how she's done all these various different papers. And one of the really nice uh, papers that I recently read, uh, which got pointed to me by somebody else, uh, was this MDETR, which is this idea of multimodal uh, detection. So now we will see how the DETR architecture, because it's all a transformer, right? So we can see how this. Uh, I'll just actually show you a glimpse of what's happening. Um, so in this idea, uh, we will see how you can say to an image, you can say you want to find the bounding box location and classification of a pink elephant, and then it can create a bounding box around a pink elephant. And these are not like masks or anything. These are the actual pixels. So you could have said a blue elephant and it would have created a bounding box around this blue elephant. So we're going to see that. Uh, in two weeks from now. Um, so with that being said, uh, thanks everybody for joining me today and I'll see you guys in two weeks.